Well, hey, everybody. Welcome to LifePoint Online. My name is Ethan Whiteside, and this is... Cindy Whiteside. Yeah. I like your shirt. I like your shirt. I think mine's like the winter edition, which is actually just a white shirt underneath it. Let me Mm -hmm. see the back. Yeah. Here's the back. Oh, my goodness. This is awesome. This is our Devoted 22, where we're focusing on the apostles' teaching, the breaking of bread, and prayer. That is so awesome. Ethan, I'm so glad we got one, and it's great because everybody can get one. Did you know Yes. Yes, you can get one. Um, We're going to have them at our in-person location for $10, so if you make your way to one of our locations, you can buy one for yourself and you can wear this swag that we've got on. Oh, that's so great. Hey, and as we head in Devoted 22, I really want to encourage all of you to get involved in a group if you're not already in one. We have some awesome groups that are starting up this week. We have the Rooted Experience. We have a few spots left in that, so if you want to be in that, you need to put that on your Connect card right away. We also have Life's Healing Choices that starts this week, and going through a pandemic Mm. and just life in general can leave you with hurts and habits and anxiety and things like that. And this class can really give you some good biblical Mm -hmm. ways to deal with all that. So be sure to mark groups on your connect card and we'll reach out to you right away. Right, right. Well, hey, if you're worshiping with us for the first time, we want to invite you to try five. We hope that you'll continue to join us over the next five weeks. And as an incentive, when you finish Try 5, we will donate $25 to one of our community partners on your behalf. So just by trying five, you'll already be joining us on the mission to impact the community. So let us know each week as you move through Try 5 on the Connect card. Oh, and that Connect card. I love our Connect card because we'd love to get one from everyone worshiping online mm-hmm. with us. You can get it through LifePoint's app. Uh, if you don't have the app yet, you should get it. But Uh, If you don't have it yet, scan the QR code that comes up on the screen on your phone. Just hold your camera up and scan that code. You'll find the Connect card there, as well as other great resources for getting connected at LifePoint. Right, right. Well, hey, one of the things that we like to do here every week at LifePoint is practice generosity. Your generosity is having an impact. It impacts our church, which impacts our community, which in turn will impact the world. Mm -hmm. So we thank you for your giving. Um, If you'd like to make a gift today, you can do that on the LifePoint app or visit our website. We're going to worship through song here in just a few minutes, so why don't you guys get up, prepare your hearts, and let's sing to our King. You gave your life for mine, nailed to the cross. You crucified all my sin and shame. It was washed by your mercy. You are the treasure I find, my reason for living. So let my life become an offering to the one who is worthy.
What makes you angry? Like ready to fight kind of angry. What makes you want to defend or speak up or just let somebody have it? For me, I don't really have a temper and it takes a lot for me to get mad. In fact, I don't think my wife has ever seen me really angry. And when I am angry, I don't have a hard time controlling it. But there's some things that could get me there. If you harm my family, you're gonna see anger. If you try to harm our church, you're gonna see anger. And you probably have your list too. So why do those things make me angry? Why does your list make you angry? For me, it's because of the love I have for my family and the love I have for my church. It is my great love for those things that could invoke anger if they're harmed, especially intentionally harmed. And today, we're gonna be introduced to a part of God's nature that many people don't like to talk about, consider, or even believe in. That is his anger or the way Paul is gonna say it, his wrath. Now we're in week three of a series through the book of Romans. And if you miss parts one and two, check those out so you can hear the history and context of the writing of one of the most profound and influential books in the Bible. It was written by the apostle Paul to a new church in Rome. And Paul writes some of the core truths of Christianity. He shares why the gospel is such good news. And he challenges us over and over through the book of Romans to align our lives with Christ. Also, be sure to check out what's happening at LifePoint Church throughout 2022. We're on a journey called Devoted, and you can find out all about that if you go to devoted22.com. It's a year-long vision, and that year-long vision motivated us to teach through the book of Romans as we consider what the first century church actually taught and believed. 
You can also order one of these Romans journals with the NIV text. It's a great resource. It's got places for you to take notes. You can follow along with us. Uh, there's a link on the screen below to take you right to a page where you can order one of those. Last week, we ended with a three-part challenge based on what Paul said in Romans 1, verses 8 through 17. And here was the challenge. Look for ways to be an encouragement to others. Look for ways that you're moving with culture instead of against it, because Christians are called to live different. And the last was a challenge to look for ways to declare that you are not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It comes from what Paul said in verse 16 when he said this, for I'm not ashamed of the gospel because it's the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes, first the Jew, then the Gentile. Understanding that verse will give you some insight on what Paul goes into next. And today we're gonna to be challenged by learning about God's righteous anger. Listen what he says in verse 18 of chapter one. The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of people who suppress the truth by their wickedness. Now, Paul setting them up to better understand God's attitude about sin, that which separates us from him. So he starts talking about wicked people and what happens to wicked people. And wrath just means anger. Your translation that you use uh, may say anger, it may say displeasure, but they all mean the same thing. Now, for many people, even many teachers, it's uncomfortable to think about our God who is the very definition of love as angry. Now, we think of anger as unhealthy, as full of rage or revenge, but that's human anger, and it's not the same as God's anger. In our culture of sensitivity and our culture of easily hurt feelings, talking about healthy anger can be uncomfortable. But anger is an emotion that even Jesus himself experienced it. There's several times in the New Testament we read about Jesus getting angry. One of them is in the Gospel of Mark, chapter 10, when people were bringing their kids to Jesus to be prayed over. Jesus was teaching, people saw him there, they knew he had power, so they brought their kids so he could pray over them and bless them. And Jesus' disciples that day thought he was too important to worry about these kids, so they rebuked the kids and the parents. And here's what happened next. In Mark chapter 10, beginning at verse 14, it says this. When Jesus saw this, the disciples pushing these kids away from him, he was indignant. He said to them, let the little children come to me and do not hinder them for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. On more than one occasion, Jesus showed his anger. In Matthew 21, he saw people taking advantage of the poor and he ran them out of the temple. I'm glad that our savior got upset when the innocent were harmed. I'm glad he got upset when people were being taken advantage of because the fact Jesus got upset only proves his deep love for each of us. Now, not all teachers, not all pastors, not all leaders believe this. Progressive author Richard Rohr, who's way outside the thought of historical Christianity, shared this about God's wrath. He said, I don't believe there's any wrath in God whatsoever. It's theologically impossible when God is Trinity. Now, that sounds great. That sounds reasonable. But it disagrees with the teachings of the Bible and therefore is wrong. I don't care what Richard Rohr believes. I care what the word of God teaches. And the word of God teaches that God does get angry. You can wish it was different. You can say you don't like it, but the fact still remains we serve a God that gets angry. Do you really think we serve a God that doesn't get angry when something comes between us and him? I hope he does. God's righteous anger only shows his great love for us. My wife and daughters are blessed that I would get angry if somebody tries to harm them. And I'm glad God gets angry at the sin that separates me from him. That's what true love requires. He wants to be in relationship with us, his creation. So much so that he gives us free will, free choice. And when we choose sin over him, of course he's displeased. That's what Paul's trying to communicate here because he's getting ready to talk about specific sin. So he's letting them know the sin you're in brings the wrath of God because he loves you so much. 
What kind of God would he be if he saw something separating us and him and just said, eh, that's too bad. Hey, I love you. It's easy for us to compare righteous anger with human anger, especially for those who may have grown up around an angry person. So when you hear the word anger, it it brings emotions in you. Or maybe you live with somebody like that now. That's not the kind of anger Paul is referring to. Try to dismiss the idea of human anger, human anger that hurts, that wounds, that scars for years to come. And think of a righteous anger that comes from God towards the things that separate us from the ideal that God has for us. God wants to see all come to salvation. To be saved means there's something we need to be saved from, our sin. So the wrath of God burns against the things that separate us from him. And that's a good thing. Notice Paul says his wrath is being revealed. So Paul is saying the wickedness of people suppresses the truth now, currently, then and now. So what's the truth? Well, the basic truth that there is a God who is in control that we're created to be in relationship with, to obey him and to be loved by him. In short, they suppressed the truth that God saves sinful people. Some reject that, refuse to believe it, refuse to follow him, refuse to believe that they could be in sin and that they need to change. And when that truth is suppressed, it brings up the wrath of God. Paul goes on to explain to the Romans exactly what that wickedness was in verse 19. Listen as he says this. Since what may be known about God is plain to them because he's made it plain to them. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made so that people are without excuse. It's like Paul is anticipating somebody saying, wait, 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 wait. What about people who don't know any better? Is God going to hold it against someone because they've never heard of him? And Paul is saying, that's not a good argument. Everybody knows better. It's evident to all, even those who say there's no God, that there is a divine power who is at work. Think about it. Everything God creates, Satan distorts. By looking at his creation, by looking at God's creation, mankind can see that there's a creator. And then Satan comes along and says, no, you're smarter than that. So people said, you know, God didn't create the earth. It just happened. But Paul says the evidence is so clear by looking at what God made that people have no excuse. See, man didn't create it. Something can't come from nothing. So the only thing left is a divine creator. And in verse 20, that phrase, what has been made, comes from one small Greek word that's pronounced poema. It's where we get our word poem. Now, if I were a poet and I were to write my wife a poem, it would be out of my love for her. It would be vulnerable and it would make my love for her clear. It would be my work of art for her. And that is what God has done for us. He made the universe from nothing for us because he loves us. And Paul said he did it so intricately that those who reject him as their God have no excuse because it's clear from all that's around us that there is a higher, more powerful being than ourselves. Richard Linsky in his commentary on Romans says this, man cannot charge God with hiding himself from them and thus excuse their irreligion and their immorality. Then Paul turns to talking about morality. And he's talking about how suppressed truth led to moral decay. Now, it's not popular today to talk about moral decay because most students who maybe are watching today, you've been taught for decades that there is no such thing as absolute moral law. You can truly do what you feel. So if you feel it inside, it must be okay. And if it makes you happy, then you must pursue it and do it. And the moral law of our day is this. There's no moral law. Morality has become subjective. What's true for me may not be true for you and vice versa. In the book, I Don't Have Enough Faith to Be an Atheist, Norman Geisler says this, if moral law doesn't exist, then there's no moral difference between the behavior of Mother Teresa and that of Hitler. 
and he's correct. If there is no absolute moral law and we are governed simply by our own desires and feelings, who decides? Well, just be a nice person and don't hurt anybody. Okay, that's great. That's a great statement. But who gets to decide what's nice? Who determines that? God's boundaries of morality have been given to us and we can see what's natural and unnatural from the world around us. Paul goes on in verse 21 to say this. For although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him, but their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images made to look like mortal human being and birds and animals and reptiles. Paul's making a statement about humanity here. Those that suppress the truth refuse to acknowledge God. Those who live for themselves and refuse God's nature, their hearts were darkened. And so they shifted their attention from God to something else. Paul calls it an exchange. They knew the creator and then they turned and worshiped the created instead. He's showing the progression of their sin. First, they don't glorify God, their creator. Then their hearts go dark and then they worship idols and images. See, in the ancient world, you could just choose your God. You could choose a God for wisdom. You could choose a God for protection, for fertility, for sex, for pleasure. You name it and the world had a God for it and you chose that God and you worship that God. That's called paganism. Everyone just choosing their own God. No one judges anyone else, but they hope that their God proves to be superior. And here we are in the 21st century with paganism on the rise, people choosing their own objects of worship. It's not only tolerated, it's celebrated. And before our eyes, we're watching the world exchange what God's plan for their life is, God's plan for sexuality, and exchanging it for the worship of the God of choice in our culture, self. Think about that. God gives humanity an opportunity to live in his glory. He promises answers that can be found nowhere else, forgiveness that is unlimited, love that is so deep we can't even understand it. And for the love of self, there are those who would say, I would rather have what I want for me than what God wants for me. See, if your God is self, you can justify any action you want because the God you worship says it's okay and it's natural and it's necessary and it's good because I feel it. Think about our culture and what people fight for. Once you convince yourself that you deserve to be at the top, then you'll do anything to get there. Once you determine that God has someone picked out for you that's not your spouse, well, leaving's easy because the God you worship says it's okay. You just need to be happy. That's what God wants for you. Worshiping the God of self justifies greed, theft, sex with anyone, all because the God of self says it feels good, it feels right, and it's okay. Now you might think, I don't worship those things. We were created to worship the creator. So if we reject him, then we're gonna worship something else. We're either gonna worship God or we're gonna worship something else. Consider what author Tim Keller says about worship. He says this, there has to be something which captures our imagination and our allegiance, which is the resting place of our deepest hopes and which we look to to calm our deepest fears. Whatever that thing is, we worship it. And so we serve it. It becomes our bottom line, the thing we cannot live without, defining and validating everything we do. It was St. Augustine when talking about what we worship he referred to it as the disordering of our loves. Now think back to what I said about God's wrath. He's angered by that which separates us from him, by our sin. God's judgment on their wickedness was just to give them what they wanted. In Romans chapter one, verse 24, listen to what Paul says. Therefore, God gave them over and the sinful desires of their hearts to sexual impurity for the degrading of their bodies with one another. They exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshiped and served created things rather than the creator who is forever praised. 
Amen. See, God says, you want that life? All right, I'll give you over to it. You worship that life? I will give you over to it. See, God gave us free will. And Paul is saying that if you want to live your sinful desires, obeying every feeling you have, then God will turn you over to that. Now, in this section, Paul focuses on their object of worship. It was sex. Now, this comes up a lot in Paul's writings to this church and to other churches because they obviously had a problem with it. Now, how does that apply to us today? Well, if you don't think our world worships sex, you need to pay attention. The porn industry brings in about $12 billion a year, more than Major League Baseball, which brings in $10.7 billion per year. The average kid sees pornography at age 11. 15% of babies are born out of wedlock. That's 21 million babies every year. About 12% of teenagers are confused about their sexuality. Over 600,000 abortions are performed every year. Families are broken up. Marriages are destroyed. Women are abused and trafficked all because our culture worships sex. Look, God has a plan for sexuality. It's a man and a woman in marriage and nothing else. Now, what if you violated that? Well, you need to know the goodness of God because he loves so much. He forgives. He gives second chances. He lets you start over. He resets the clock. You can regain your innocence all by choosing to trust in the goodness and grace and love of God. Because you have free will, you get to choose if you let your desires run your life or not. You can either choose your desires or God. When God gives us his truth and we obey his truth, it's the greatest deal ever. We're messed up. We've done things we shouldn't. And God comes in and loves us so deeply and gives us purpose we could never have on our own. Paul is saying some people will love themselves and their desires so much that they will exchange the truth of God's love for the lie that anything other than him can fulfill you, can rescue you, can forgive you, and place you forever in his son, Jesus Christ. God's wrath does come against sin, and he will allow you to follow your own desires. But later, it's Paul himself, later in the book of Romans, that tells us that it's God's kindness that's gonna lead us to repentance. The kindness that says, even though your life is messed up and you've done detestable things, I will forgive you if you come to me. All the sinning that Paul mentions, the sin that angers God, reinforces what he's already shared. We need a savior. We need Jesus. And Paul is setting up how we're all prone to wander away from God. But Jesus rescues us. Jesus gives us grace. And you may be caught in the middle of the greatest sin of your life, and that grace is there for you to receive it. I'm glad God gets angry at my sin because there was a day when I chose to live far away from him, but he pursued me. He allowed me to be filled with regret and discontent, but after I accepted Jesus, he didn't just free me from the sin, he released me from the regret and the discontent and filled me with the confidence that I am fiercely loved by a God that would give part of himself to see me in relationship with him and filled with his Holy Spirit. And God will do the same thing for you too. You don't have to worship created things, whether it's sex or achievement or yourself. You can exchange that and worship the God of the universe, the God who created you. If you haven't, I challenge you to accept that today, to accept Christ today, to exchange the life you've created for the one he has for you. Now, let us know in the chat if something was said today that made you say, I wanna take a step and receive that forgiveness and have freedom from that regret in my life every day. Let us know in the chat if you're watching at a moderated time or if it's on a playback time, just get in touch with us. We're here to help you take your first steps or renew your steps with God at any time. God wants our worship. God deserves our worship. And he is full of wrath against anything that would separate us from him because he loves us so much. 
He loves you that much. And that's the message that Paul is trying to say. Now, next week, we're going to get further into Romans chapter one, where he continues to talk about the progression of sin and the lives of those who suppress the truth by their wicked ways. So read ahead in Romans chapter one, get one of these journals and get ready to learn even more about God's wonderful grace and his will for our lives as we journey through the book of Romans together. Let's pray. God, today, uh, for many people, it's hard to think about your wrath. But God, we're thankful. Thankful that you get angry at the things that separate us, the people you created to love you and to be in relationship with you from you. And God, I pray that those who don't know Christ, who don't have that relationship with him, that, that gives us the strength to say no to sin, to say no to self, God, may they make the decision today to exchange the lie for the truth that you love them deeply and you fight for them fiercely and you want everyone to come to a place where they are in relationship with your son, Jesus. And I pray this in his name. Amen. All right, Ethan, as we get ready to go, I want to just make sure everybody remembers to sign up for a group if you're not already in one. Do that on your Connect card. Yep. And don't forget to head over to devoted22.com to find suggested resources, messages, and more to help you stay connected and take next steps on this devoted journey that we're going through as a church. Have a great week, everybody. Great. We'll see you next week.